Hey guys, it's Mountain Walk, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about the most important cards to me in MTG and every single year. Inspired by uh, a recent video by Saffron Olive uh, that he put out on MTG Goldfish uh, about the most important cards in every year of Magic the Gathering, I decided instead, I'm like, wow, this is a really cool idea. I'll just release a video about the most uh, important cards to me or the ones that I remember the most. Um, or the most formative to me that really changed the way I looked at the game and understood it and things like that. And some of it's just like fun cards. A lot of them are just fun cards, you know, uh, but some of them are like kind of landmark milestone things. So yeah, as you can see, uh, certainly one of my favorite cards uh, back in the day was Jade Leech, which is actually really good if you can believe it. Um, in, in the uh, the Fires decks, it was kind of a nice top end uh, you know, just another four mana five five, which really at that point uh, was kind of uh, not really seeing that sort of level of efficiency. Anyways, so let's let's get to it. We'll start from 1993 and work our way forward. So now, originally, of course, you know, perhaps this really goes without saying, the most important card, as well as the most um, powerful card in the game, the most recognizable. Uh, would be Black Lotus. Clearly, that's indisputable. Uh, but when I think of 1993, I think these early years of the game, the early cards from those sets, the first thing I think of is Lord of the Pit. I remember seeing this card thinking like 7 mana, 7-7, seven, seven, Flying Trample. This thing must be like the greatest creature of all time, you know, almost as good as Scaled Worm, you know. Um, uh, but it's like it always deals damage and it's hard to block and like, you know, but you need to sacrifice stuff to it. I'm like, like in my head, I'm thinking of like all the things that have to sacrifice. And then people are like, no, you just play Breeding Pit. And I'm like, wow, this card also has Pit in its name. It must be made specifically for Lord of the Pit, you know. And I, I had no idea if it actually was or wasn't. Um, I didn't even know what Breeding Pit was. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. These cards work together in a really cool way. Um, they're so thematic and stuff. And I was like, wow, what is going on here? You know, has great art. It's such a cool thing. Um, and that's, you know, I think how most people experience magic. I mean, even probably still to this day, the, the grand uh, majority of people is just, you know, in a casual sense or whatever. And uh, Lord of the Pit really exemplifies that to me. When I think of early magic, I think of how I used to play the game um, and, and how casual players still play it. Like things like what Lord of the Pit sort of symbolizes, the, the, the big fatties and you know with drawbacks but you can build around them and they're so fun to you know when they actually get to work and things like that and it feels so good to, to you know slam it down onto the battlefield and stuff um it, it's gotta be lore of the pit that's 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 how most people experienced alpha beta unlimited revised and sets like that you know not casting like time twisters and and uh you know dual lands and black lotus and moxen and stuff like that they were casting lore of the pit you know <laughs> what a sweet card uh and now for something completely different uh this card uh whew, yeah if you've never played against uh mana drain in a competitive environment obviously this card is still very very powerful in a format like um commander right like in, in in some respects it's it's still very good there right but it's a, it's a different kind of thing where like in in competitive environments like you're you know you don't ever really want to run any of your spells out into like a mana drain like that's pretty much why basically every single aggro deck was like topped out at one mana like sometimes you would play two mana spells but like in formats like vintage back in the day like in the early 2000s late 90s and stuff um I mean, really, up until even in the, the beginning, like the, you know, the Weissman style control decks like Keeper or the deck or whatever, these multicolor, glacially slow um, decks, and they would play Mana Drain and like all the other like just ridiculous um, control cards. So think like the Abyss, Moat, <laughs> Mana Drain itself, Source of Plashers, sometimes Bolt, you know, things like Fireball were occasionally played as win conditions or millstone or or Sarah angel or whatever but it would just play all the like ridiculous stuff like oh yeah i get i can play you know mistress factory and i can play demonic tutor and like it could just play all the the best cards and it was basically just the best deck forever um 
and it was so brutal to play against this deck because like getting any of your stuff drained into like a moat or something was just like game losing um and again this this was like that for a really long time even up until the mid mid 2000s or whatever uh like it was just you know you, you never really wanted to getting your Frexian negator uh drained into like an abyss or moat or something like that was just so brutal um it, it's 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 hard to it's hard to say you know how unfun and how like insane this card was like counterspell was printed in alpha and the, <laughs> the next year they're like we know what to do <laughs> it's just let's staple let's staple a bunch of mana and uh yeah that'll be fair you know even back then with like the stupid um uh you know mana burn or whatever like that was so relevant because you could sink it into like j and day tone to draw a card or brain geyser or like i said like some of the other broken legends enchantments like what were they even thinking like literal like avgn.gif like what were they thinking um yeah legends was uh quite the set i mean when you <laughs> look i mean it's probably ha got to have the biggest variance in power level of anything honestly i mean maybe that's alpha but like there's so many bad legends uh in legends and then like you have cards like drain and tabernacle and stuff and it's like what is going on here anyways this was one of the most frustrating brutal unfun cards to play against and i'm kind of happy that just in general that like the you know the strategy's weaker that there's more counters to it um obviously things like cavern of souls is a huge huge uh thing so um for example like the 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 goblin uh recruiter combo decks in vintage these days can run uh you know cavern to dodge uh force of will and the occasionally played mana drain like in land still or something but anyways this is one of the most brutal absurd like unbelievable cards like you just sort of look at it, you're like well, what is going on here like i don't even know what's going on in the art again more martisan art you have these like little things that are sucking up things and I don't know. I mean, obviously it's underwater, I think. I, who knows? There, there's a lot going on here. Um, the, the legacy of this card is incredible. Uh, still banned in legacy, speaking of which, which maybe it could be unbanned, but that's a conversation for a different time. Anyways, uh, you know, mana drain. WTF. All right. And the first real deck that uh, was able to actually um pressure or or oppose the ridiculous like blue decks at the time were of course the necropotence decks now again originally we've talked about this before in other videos about how necro was like you know sort of popularly seen as like this weird confusing card like one of the worst cards in the set of ice age um and blah 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 but eventually it became clear that this card is pretty ridiculous once you get through all the lines of text typically you know back in the day cards that had a lot of text were just like bad you know like those bad rare enchantments that just had like a million lines of text or whatever um very confusing didn't really do anything necropotence was uh um the exception to this rule where it had very specific things it wouldn't let you you know try and draw extra cards to discard things to cheat in uh fatties with like animate dead or something it was like okay you gotta do x y and z and then like then you can really do your thing so uh obviously necropotence ended up being like absurdly broken i mean completely out of this world and again for for some reason this card is the this card is the whole shebang it's confusing uh it's extremely powerful it has incredible again mark teeth art again you know perhaps one of the most famous awesome arts in the game of this powerful lich um i mean that's so cool uh you know and uh i mean it's great uh this was a symbolic of black this is a big thing of a black's uh identity in the early years even up until about 2000 when it got banned or restricted in most formats again more or less rightfully so but black hasn't really um recovered in some respects i think uh with like dark ritual and necro and stuff not being legal or banned or whatever uh in a lot of formats but again maybe a different conversation for another time but this card is extremely powerful i mean it's undeniably powerful one of the most powerful cards in the game 
really um, super fun, really interesting gameplay. It is exploitable, right? It does make you even weaker to red decks, which around this time were sort of being developed, you know, the the burn slash sly style decks with a bunch of dorks and, um, you know, incinerates and lightning bolts and things like that. So, um, yeah, uh, Necro, I mean, what more can you say? Uh, certainly an iconic card, an extremely powerful card, uh, one I loved playing in like Suicide Black and Vintage. Uh, definitely one of the most fun cards, you know, there where it's just like, oh boy, when you're drawing like, you know, Wastelands and Strip Mine and Him to Turox and Sinkholes and Dress and all these other cool cards. Oh man, it just felt so good. Like leaving your opponent with nothing and you having a Phyrexian Negator in play. That was such a great memory. Um, and I, I love I love playing with uh, Necropotence. Definitely uh, one of my favorite cards. Okay, and now we have Force of Will, also kind of another one of my favorite cards. Uh, it's a card that I've played a ton in a bunch of different blue decks over the years. Uh, it's basically required, it's basically the most important card in, in you know, Vintage and Legacy to sort of keep things uh, in check, right? It's the only reason why we can have all these crazy combo decks, although obviously certain other sideboard cards help a lot too, but Force being the powerful main deck, a uh, ubiquitous sort of universal answer to everything, almost everything, right, um, is, is really important uh, to actually make these formats play out in a non-degenerate way. Uh, and of course, there's a real cost. You know, again, the, the one life is somewhat negligible, uh, but certainly pitching a card is, is, you know, not always free. So, yeah, Force Will, very important for the health of uh, eternal formats, Vintage and Legacy in particular. Um, it's just such an iconic, powerful card. Look at this incredible Therese Nielsen art. I mean, really iconic. Um, just so good. So good. I absolutely love it. Um, you know, it be casting this card and then like casting Gush and, and Yagmas Will and Fast Bond and like replaying all my lands and stuff and, and, and grow a tog in the vintage decks at that time. Oh man, that was crazy. That was so crazy. Super fun. Um, so yeah, not much more to say about this guy. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's the, one of the most important cards in the game for just keeping things, um, actually functioning, right? You, you know, Legacy and Vintage would be completely different, uh, without this card. So yeah, I love it. Great stuff. Another card that also reminds me of the early years of Magic. Again, when I was playing, uh, decks like Suicide Black, uh, they often played, main deck Null Rods, because Null Rod was, of course, very good against Moxon and things like that. And this is definitely a card I like playing because it's very powerful against artifact decks. You know, again, say, say something like Affinity. Um, certainly one of the reasons why Affinity can never really, has never really gotten, like, too big of a foothold in, in things like Legacy or Vintage, like, classic sort of Affinity, because um, certainly maybe just even just the threat of, of Null Rod. And Obviously, other reasons too, but uh, very, very powerful against artifact based decks. Uh, really great art, um, Anson Maddox art, and of course, a very iconic flavor text about the not doing anything, does nothing kind of thing. So, uh, very cute flavor text, great art, um, just, just absolute perfect old school magic card of just. Um, and, and it hasn't inspired, its design has inspired a ton of different sort of imitators. Think of like Damping Sphere, which is a clear reference to Null Rod or just other two mana hate cards, um, whether they be hate bears or whatnot, but yeah, definitely uh, very sweet. Okay, now we have Duress. Again, this is another card I think, well, more than Null Rod, is just, it is the total package. This is a great card to main deck. Um, it uh, has great art, you know, it's uh, one of the better discard spells. It's very fair, um, gives you great information. Uh, it's, it's definitely just the, the total package, you know, anytime like duress is good. I feel like, um, I don't know if that means the meta is good or not, but I just like when duress is good. I like the art. Uh, it's, it's so cool. You know, this Tolarian scholar guy and oh my, I don't know, his cursed totem is getting <laughs> discarded or something. Um, you know, again, good flavor text from, from Gix or Gee or whatever his name is. Uh, I mean, just a lot of really cool stuff here. Um, Duress is just one of the, one of the best 
um, longest lasting sort of disruptive cards. You know, again, uh, black decks oftentimes will prefer something like duress to something like the superior thought sees because the two life is a big cost. Like I said, because of things like uh, necropotence or even things like doomsday and stuff. Um, so duress, uh, still very good today. Very sweet card, very powerful, has its place. Um, and, and definitely, uh, you know, one of the um, better cards in <laughs> Urza Saga. Of course, there's, you know, things like Academy and Yawgmoth's Will, which, you know, were like, again, another head scratcher. Like, how did this make it through? But again, <laughs> whatever, whatever, you know. We love Duress, so that's good enough for me. Okay. And now a card that's maybe not the best designed, at least one that wasn't exactly super well designed for standard, mostly because um, like some other cards on this list later on, uh, the cost of play port was, it was just too free. Even, you know, two color decks would play it and uh, it wasn't, um, didn't exactly have the best gameplay, you know, the port your port kind of stuff and port you end of turn. And, you know, it was, so not only was it ubiquitous, but it was also miserable to play against. So that wasn't fun. Um, and so it did end up getting banned in block, I believe. And in, um, invasion, uh, they released, uh, you know, Teferi's response and, and Sabo's web to hate on port, uh, pretty powerful hate cards, certainly. Um, so that did, you know, uh, curtail its dominance a little bit, uh, but it was still ubiquitous. There was really, again, no uh, uh, downside to running this card because it was just four colorless lands in your deck. Not that hard to accommodate. Um, but I think the real upside on this card was its um, uh, viability in older formats. So think of like Extended or Legacy or, or whatever. Uh, really fun there. I think it had interesting gameplay. You know, when do you port them? Um, on like, you know, upkeep, draw step, uh, you know, main phase or um, during combat and step. I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, play skill and, and, and options and, and stuff like that uh, with this card. So, like, uh, it's really cool. It's really fun. It's, again, a really important part of, like, the Wasteland Aether Vial port sort of trifecta that you can build around, you know, think of like death and taxes and goblins and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, a card with a checkered past, right? Wasn't very good in the, uh, for the formats and block and, and standard. Um, but it was really fun and just great in formats like legacy and extended and, and stuff at the time. So, and of course I just love it. I love the art, this Jerry Tertilli art. Um, you know, I've been playing port since almost since it was printed and, uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, really, really fun. And overall, I'd say the card is fairly balanced, you know, trade two of your mana for one of your opponents. And, you know, obviously you can break, uh, this, the, the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Break, break like the, the, you know, uh, symmetry of it, I guess, maybe obviously two for one is not very great, but if you're able to still play spells with, Aether Vial, obviously, uh, it's it's a lot less punishing to tap your opponent's stuff down. So, um, it's just a sweet card. Just so many uh, different great things you can do with it. Very skill testing. Uh, big fan. Big fan. Blastoderm, definitely my, probably my favorite creature from back in the day. Um, not only because it was just, has this ridiculous art, like, or did this dude have a bunch of grapes on his back? Like, what is going on with this beast? Like, what is happening? Are they in Sky Shroud? Like, okay, like, what, what, what is the deal here? Um, but I remember looking at this card and was like, wow, this must be, like, the most powerful card ever. This must be, like, super expensive. And then I remember, like, going to the, uh, the card shop and, like, picking some up and getting them for, like, a buck a piece. You know, I'm like, holy crap, that's amazing. I thought they were going to be like 10 bucks a piece, right? Because they look so, so strong. Um, but yeah, only, only, <laughs> only a buck a piece, you know, because they're just commons. Play with these cards so much and fires. Oh, it was just so much fun. Uh, huge, huge fan of this card. Uh, just so ridiculous. It definitely like, even still today, looking back at it, I'm like, how is this a real card? What is going on here? Uh, but yeah, definitely a, a, an outlier in, in creatures from the first few years of the game. Uh, but I loved it. Like I said, a lot of these cards are just my favorite cards 
Uh, but this guy certainly had a very big impact. Again, I think I, I'd still probably maintain that this is basically the best creature ever printed for not only its effect in every format that it was legal in, so block, standard, extended, um, legacy and vintage or whatever at the time, uh, but it's just its ability to take over and completely centralize games. Its ability is a powerful combo piece, um, really broke uh, having a lot of access to extra cards. So think of things like Fact of Fiction or Ancestral Recall in older formats. Intuition AK, <laughs> clearly Gush, uh, was completely busted. So uh, this, this card just, I mean, it was great in the formats it was introduced in. It scaled insanely well in older formats. This was like basically the, uh, <laughs> forgive the pun, like the high tide of uh, powerful blue cards. You just had tons of blue instants that were, you know, broken or just really powerful, just really good counter magic like counter spell, force spike, memory lapse, circular logic, you know, undermine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this was all available like in standard at the time, you know, and then when you go to older formats, of course, you have things like Mana Drain and like the Hulk uh, uh, Tog control decks and vintage or, you you know, obviously uh, the Grow a Tog played like Duress and Force and uh, sometimes Rebs and it just the whole the whole nine yards. It was just just crazy. Just, just you had to be there. I mean, this thing was about as ubiquitous as you can get. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely one of my favorite cards, one of the most iconic cards, like look at this great art, it's totally ridiculous, like, um, you know, the sort of goofy looking thing, but also kind of menacing, uh, big, big fan of Tog, big fan of Psychotog, um, and, uh, definitely one of the most important cards to me from 2001. All right, and a big, uh, part of why Tog was so good in older formats uh, think of something like Grow a Tog or Hulk, uh, was the inclusion of fetch lands. Of course, obviously the fetch lands themselves pump Tog, but they let you play a, you know, four color deck, uh, four color tempo deck with your fetches and dual lands. And you could just, you know, splash for your one or two volcanic islands, um, and like a, a, t a tropical or two. And then you got your four underground seas and then a bunch of fetches and maybe like an island. To, to dodge things like Back to Basics or, or Blood Moon or whatever. I mean, uh, the, these cards have enabled, um, subtly so, uh, a lot of ridiculous things. Like, I don't think anyone really understood, like, people understood that Fetch Lands were good with Dual Lands, right? This is why they were introduced after the original Dual Lands had rotated out of Extended, um, was because, obviously, like, the very obvious synergy right, of them, them being good, you know, because the, the old slow fetches from Mirage, um, which put the land in play tap, were even still played, you know, think of things like Super Grow played like those deck, those old uh, slow fetches, so these were just uh, out and out better, right, like the one life didn't matter when you can just play like three or four colors very, very easily, uh, and this was true back in 2002, right, obviously, you know, like these things really trivialized, um playing multiple colors splashing colors things like that and of course they have enabled not only just tog but things like death Rite shaman and uh the dell spells so things like treasure cruise or of course very recently merc tide regent um i mean these things did so much and so it's very apparent to us now in 2022 but not exactly in 2002 again we knew they were good we knew they did a lot of things but we didn't understand i think like how good they were going to be especially because like um i don't think anyone maybe expected more sets like odyssey all the time it seems like every set there's always new graveyard centric stuff like graveyard is a second hand it's just uh, uh kind of what they do anymore but these cards uh obviously incredible art i love the art the rob alexander and of course the anthony s waters art on the original fetches is just very very good um, I love playing with these cards. I remember seeing foils of them for like 10 bucks and then five bucks for the regular versions at the uh, local card shop in 2002. Uh, that's definitely a great memory. <laughs> One I like to think back on. I remember getting a bunch of flooded strands for like my blue white, like white weenie, like meddling mage aggro control deck from extended, you know, with my exalted angels and stuff like that. That was sweet. 
uh, yeah, I mean, great, great cards. Definitely good memories, um, and obviously pretty important to the game in general. And this guy. <laughs> You're probably thinking, wow, Killmouth Dragon? Yes, that's right. Like I said, important to me. So obviously this guy has incredible art. I don't know what the hell is going on with this weird Carl Critchlow art with like this dragon with all these little pointy things or pokey things or vents or whatever, you know, maybe because he's like got a kill mouth. So he needs to vent some of the heat off him. Um, I just this is such a cool card. Like I love the, like the, the it's almost monochromatic, right, with all the, the different sort of reds and oranges and whatever. Um, and, and the card is like, you know, it's a seven mana five five with amplify three. And it's kind of weird because, like, it wants you to tap it, but it also wants you to attack with it because it deals more damage that way. But it didn't matter to me. I was like, I saw this card and I'm like, this thing can get huge with, like, all these other dragons. And I remember making, like, a dragon deck back in the day, um, you know, and, like, putting Killmouth in there and then, like, casting it and, like, getting, like, you know, six counters on it. And then, like, it's just huge, you know. I'm like, wow, this is awesome, you know, and... Uh, it's definitely something I really, really had a lot of fun doing. It was so sweet. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, not as great. I mean, obviously Amplify isn't... Uh, I don't think they've even brought this mechanic back ever. Uh, did they do it in Modern Horizons 1 or 2? I'm not sure. I, I don't think so. I don't remember seeing anything with Amplify. Um, this is kind of a, a, a sweet mechanic. It's maybe a little bit hard to use correctly and you probably don't want to put it on a bunch of cards but maybe there could be like a one drop or something you can make it huge um <laughs> but anyways i just i just love this card it's so cool a uh, huge fan of kill mouth dragon just everything about this card is so perfect like the best timmy card ever um and the best mountain walk card too i love big dragons just everything about this card is sweet i want to get one in foil because this card is so cool um Anyways, but yeah, I love it. Okay, and now for something completely different. Uh, yeah, it's hard to not put Skull Clamp on this list because of how insane it was. So, now, I mean, I remember, like, I had a pretty sweet card shop, and, like, everyone, a bunch of my friends were playing, and, like, other people I just met through playing Magic, they were all playing. And then, like, Darksteel came out, and like because of how oppressive affinity was especially with skull clamp like you know there were multiple tournaments where the top 64 there was 58 out of 64 decks like or even 64 out of 64 decks that were playing all skull clamps uh so yeah this is kind of a level of dominance like you just i mean is extremely rare even in magic um even with a lot of the mistakes they've made today it's it's really hard to because maybe like a lot of newer players will think back to like Cobblade or something like oh this deck was so oppressive or whatever but like that wasn't anything like the decks that you had playing against affinity were like we are mono vindicates against you and that wouldn't even be enough half the time so i mean it, it it's hard to to um unless you were there right to to experience it it's hard to describe how broken it was uh, and you know lo our local car shop at the time didn't really recover very well like just a bunch of people just stopped playing like they're like this is ridiculous you know and uh, uh that was pretty unfortunate and that's probably why i remember skull clamp so well was just like how it destroyed like the uh you know like the play groups and stuff that i had at the time people just stopped playing you know um and it took a long time for it to recover at least a couple of years, you know, so yeah, and it, it not and it didn't get to like the point where it was like everyone, you know, came back. It was we got some new players, but you know, yeah, pretty pretty sad. Um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, I do like Skull Clamp. I think it is an extremely strong and interesting card. I think it promotes the right kind of things um, for certain uh, archetypes, right? Like certain dirtily creature decks that want to play a bunch of you know, weenie creatures and, uh, you know, payoff for that would be Skull Clamp. And so I think this card is really sweet. Um, and if, unfortunately, the post ban metagame of Skull Clamp uh, was just, then it was just mono affinity, right? Which is not exactly super fun. Like the pre 
pre-ban of like Elfin Nail, uh, Goblin Bidding, and uh, uh, Clamp Affinity uh, was actually more interesting and more fun uh, than the basically one deck metagame. That was that was less less fun. So anyway, Skull Clamp. That's a like I said. This is this is probably one of the few cards I would say. Yeah, this is the most broken card they printed since 2000. Uh, there's a couple other cards, some not on this list, uh, that would uh, also uh, probably qualify as well. But yeah, Skull Clamp, what a card. And a card that is actually pretty good and well designed is Dark Confidant. I guess you could say, like, Phyrexian Arena is like the first time they really nailed, like, the pay life draw card thing, right? Um, and Arena is certainly more balanced, less broken, per se, than Dark Confidant. Um, but it's a little underpowered. It's not a bad card and uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But Dark Confidant is like the um, slightly pushed uh, version of, of that concept, the pay life draw card thing. Um, but very balanced, still balanced, right? And definitely one of the best black creatures of all time. Definitely a, a very iconic card. I mean, there's a ton of cards from 2005, but this one I remember a lot because it was like, wow, this is really great. This card seems sweet, um, and uh, I'm just a, I'm just a huge fan of of Bob. You know, definitely a sweet invitational card. Uh, I mean, what what can you say? What more can you say about Dark Confidant? Um, this card is just just awesome. So there you go. All right, and now we have Mog War Marshal. This card is sweet. Now, why is this card important to me? Couple reasons. Basically, this is the last uh, good goblin for Goblin Tribal that they print for like 12 years, over a decade. It's pretty ridiculous. It's like they this completely forgot the entire tribe existed. Although they've been making up for it in recent years and more than that, really. Uh, but also, uh, number two, Mog War Marshal is kind of like the glue, like one of these glue cards that um, sort of uh, bring the room together, so to speak, right? The rug that ties the room together, that kind of thing, where it, it's not really like super fancy or anything, but it just does so many different things. Like, for example, back in the day, it did a great job of blocking Tarmogoyf, fogging for free, and still leaving you with a guy on board. That was awesome. You would oftentimes pay echo against things like, uh, you know, wrath effects or whatever. So if you're, they wrathed you or, or you know, um, in, any other sort of, uh, well, wrath effect, you know, you would still have a board afterwards like Pernicious Theater or something like that. So that was really sweet. Um, and just, it was like two mana for two bodies or three really. And uh, it had synergy with Skirk Prospector. So it was good just in regular instances of just playing the game or like for the uh, more combo centric dirty kitty versions um you know it was like kind of like a red ritual and had great synergy with uh, goblin war chief just an all-around great card um great wayne england art who i think uh off the top of my head i think he's he's passed away um very unfortunate rest in peace uh but yeah, big, big fan of uh, Mog War Marshal. Uh, this card is super sweet and basically does ev everything you want uh, in a goblin. This one's pretty simple. I love Austere Command. I run it in basically every single commander deck I have. Um, it has great Wayne England art. Um, and yeah, every every white commander deck, I love this card. You, you know, do you want to keep your tokens and stuff? Do you want to... Uh, you know, kill all the tokens. Do you want to kill all the fatties? Uh, do you want to just use this as a purify? Do you want to hit like, I mean, just the, the flexibility and um, being able to like narrow, like whatever your board state is, like choose the best options that like are, are best for you. Um, that, that kind of flexibility, versatility, whatever you want to call it, uh, I love. So yeah, I cannot get enough of Austere Command. This card is so sweet. I love it. Um, yeah, I, I basically play it in every single uh, white uh, deck that I have. Your know, aggro decks, 
or uh, control decks or whatever in Commander. This card is so sweet. Y yeah, I just love it. And speaking of Commander, uh, Michaeloth. This card is, holy crap, this is cool. I love Devourer as a mechanic. I love Sapperlings. I love Fungus. So this is like a real big, you know, sort of Fallen Empires uh, throwback kind of thing. Uh, this dude's on Jund. He's devouring stuff. And he makes, you know, tons of Sapperlings. Um, and it's so cool. This is such a sweet payoff card. Like, definitely really wants you to protect this guy and eat a bunch of stuff. And uh, he really chains up really well because, you know, he just gets twice as many counters as the things he eats, um, which is great. Like, just it is so much fun. I remember playing this guy in Throwmock um, and just any sort of uh, creature token thingy, you know, green creature token strategy in, in uh, ETH. Is, this guy is super fun. Uh, I love it. So I love everything about this card. Great art, um, great abilities. Uh, I love the sacrifice style decks. Uh, I mean, this card is so cool. The name is cool. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. This is just a sweet card. Don't think I forgot my bro Siege Gang. Originally coming out in Scourge in 2003, uh, reprinted a whole bunch of times, like three or four times or something. Um, in M10, uh, we got Siege Gang again, and this card actually has seen play basically every time it was in standard. Like it, you know, originally it was obviously in the Goblin decks as a, a top end for that, and then uh, they were printed in 10th edition and M10, so it saw play in the standards of those times, although notably in, in the Jund decks, and then it got another reprint in the original Dominaria, and it saw play in the God Pharaoh Gifts decks, I believe. Um, cause you know, it just makes a bunch of dudes. It makes a bunch of tokens and it's very, very sweet. So this thing is awesome. Definitely one of the, uh, better, uh, uh, big expensive goblins. Obviously this card is great to put in off uh, a lackey in older formats and was a huge, uh, uh, super exciting thing when that happened back in the day. Although he has been a little bit surpassed by another guy on this list, but, uh, I mean, you gotta love this old school Christopher Moeller art. Meller? Moeller? Anyways, um, just the, the silliness of it. Like, it's just perfect. Just, just perfect. Uh, Siege Game, one of my favorite cards. Um, obviously for Goblin Tribal, but actually a big role player every time it's been in standard, which is pretty impressive, you know, for just a, a dorky red dude. Um, so definitely Siege Game Commander, one of the sweetest goblins and most versatile and useful goblins ever printed. M11 had all of the titans, and holy moly, um, <laughs> these cards were ridiculous. Again, obviously Primeval being the uh, biggest out of the bunch. Of course, I I mostly remember playing Primetime uh, in Commander. Fortunately, he's been banned forever for some reason. I mean, I guess, like... That was fine a million years ago, but it just seems a little weird that he's banned these days. But anyways, um, this card is just extremely powerful. It's good basically from every format from standard down to even legacy today. The uh, Cloud Post X will play uh, Primeval Titan because it, well, it double ramps out two lands. So you can get a uh, double Glimmer Post and gain a trillion life and you can get... Um, uh, Eye of Ugin uh, and the Cloud Post and generate a million mana and cast your Ember Cool. Um, I mean, yeah, this thing is, it just gives you a value immediately. Uh, it does it every attack. It's a six man, six, six with trample, so it's a threat in its own right. So even if they do kill it, or I guess even don't kill it or whatever, um, it's still a huge threat. I mean, the, the, these. Uh, maybe maybe not underrated, right? It's just kind of shocking how powerful these six drops still are, even after all these years. And outside of the blue one, which was ironically not good, <laughs> um, the the rest of them, the green, white, red, and black one, have seen tons of play in basically every format. Like in Legacy, you know, like uh, the black one, Grave Titan, saw play because it's very good at just being ramped out by Lake of the Dead, or you know, of course you can reanimate it as well. So it's good in the reanimator decks. Um, obviously the red one's seen tons of different play, like in Vintage, uh, 
uh, Inferno Titan is just awesome to open to. It's just repeatable arc lightnings plus, you know, it cleans up all the uh, stupid flyer tokens so you never have to worry about dying to those. Um, yeah, I mean, and of course, uh, the white one is very good in Commander, and well, I guess they're all good in Commander. And they all have had their time to shine. They do have really powerful effects, but they are ultimately balanced. Um, six mana cards uh, are allowed to basically completely take over the game because they are six mana cards and they are so difficult to deploy. Uh, but it's, even still, like it's it's very impressive uh, the longevity that these cards have had. And of course, it mostly owes to like the total package of of these cards. Like they they do something uh, uh, when you play them. They do something when they attack. They're just huge, huge threats. And they definitely have held up a lot better than uh, other creatures. Um, you know, they, again, they're not like the most scariest cards of all time, but they're still very good, very impressive cards um, considering their age. So uh, I love it. Primeval Titan, very sweet. And another card. Again, remember when I mentioned. Uh, most broken card printed since 2000. Metal Misstep might be that. Uh, there, there's actually, the gameplay with Misstep is, and the deck building, um, not only is this card ubiquitous, but it's literally free to cast. Uh, the It is just the most degenerate gameplay. It completely, um, like in Legacy when it was, was legal, uh, completely shut out all the Storm decks. Like they just basically couldn't exist anymore. Uh, this was just too brutal against them. It was the worst, worst gameplay of all time. But I did like playing with this card in Goblins because it was like, wait, I can actually counter the spells that are used against my lackey now? Like encounter other people's like brainstorms? Like this is great. Like encounter lightning bolts? Like this is the greatest thing of all time. So <laughs> even though Misstep was horrendous, uh, I still have very fond memories of playing it in my uh, Goblins deck. Um, that was just so fun. It was just like, ha ha, now, now I am the one with the powerful tempo cards. Uh, and that was, it, that sort of seemed like what the purpose of it was to give like non-blue decks, you know, the ability to fight over um, and, and interact with uh, spells on the stack. Uh, obviously, they, depending on how you want to look at it, they either hit or missed on that. Maybe they, you know, were a little too good at that. And uh, anyway, so misstep, not great gameplay, very bad deck building. You know, basically every deck started as 56 cards. Um, it, yeah, a lot, a lot of issues with this card. Although, I, again, I think it came from a good place, like what they were trying to do, um, at least from what I remember from, from reading, like, you know, like Aaron Forsythe's comments from back in the day or whatever about this card. But uh, definitely, yeah, very bittersweet card. Like, I liked what they were going for. But man, like this is definitely cures worse than the uh, disease. Um, but hey, look at that art. Great Erica Yang art. Um, I don't know what other cards she has done, but this is a good one. Beautiful art. Now we have Thalia. This, I think, is kind of like a watershed moment. Because um, back in the day, uh, you know, white weenie decks were basically just like, you play a bunch of savannah lions and things like that and, and uh white knights or whatever and uh beat your opponent down with like uh aggressive creatures or, or put like an imperial armor on them or do stuff with like land tax or whatever um but death and taxes and legacy um was really the first big shift i think to playing like um a more disruptive game of of uh you know instead of just like a purely aggressive game so adding um, controlling elements and prison elements and, and things like that. Um, and of course, Thalia uh, still being like kind of the marquee card and that sort of strategy, playing very well, of course, with uh, Caracas protecting it, you know, um, you know, being a one-sided, mostly one-sided uh, sphere of resistance, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, yeah, Thalia, uh, even though it is legendary, every single deck that plays Thalia always plays four. That should tell you how good this card is. Uh, definitely one of the cards that's very, very powerful, um, but it takes some working around to get the card to, to actually work for you. You can't just play it in your control deck or something or your blue tempo deck or whatever. Um, so yeah, it, it's definitely one of the better designed magic cards. It plays great. It gives power to decks that certainly need it, right? The, 
the the dirtily white uh, sort of mid rangey uh, aggro deck or whatever uh, certainly could use the help. I mean, just again, great art. Um, there's not there's not enough you can say about how good this card is. I mean, they really hit it out of the park. Ten out of ten on every metric. Very powerful, but not unfun to play against. And uh, yeah, definitely uh, very sweet. All right, and now for something that is not fun to play against. I remember this card specifically, uh, not originally when it was printed, but when it was reprinted in the original Modern Masters. I uh, <laughs> I remember uh, winning a draft with this card. I, I vividly remember it because I just, I just drew it every game at some point uh because i had like kind of this weird dirty like blue green deck with like i don't know random stuff and then a, a veldalkin shackles and every time i played it i just won like this is one of the most ridiculous um limited cards i've ever played against even that mythic rare like <laughs> this card probably shouldn't have been in the set it was uh pretty pretty busted pretty busted it's just so hard to interact with outside of something like um you know like if someone mind controls your creature you can just kill the creature or whatever but that doesn't work with Feldalkin shackles because it's just a standalone artifact i even played like a one or two like super narrow counter spells um like because people would like obviously have to board in like uh artifact destruction which was like garbage against the rest of my deck but if you had a shackles in play like you basically can't lose because uh, you just take their best creature or whatever, and then they're just, like, if they attack, they have to, you know, throw their guy against your guy, and then you can untap and take the, the guy again. It's, like, just the card is unbelievable in limited formats. I mean, none of my games were even remotely close. I don't even think I dropped a game. It was just, uh, it was just ridiculous. And it, it was just, like, it was just like, I play it and I just shrug. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> they, just, they put this card in the set because I don't know. I don't even remember if the card was actually like very expensive because it was played in like certain decks, like as a one or two of and like control decks. And it was printed in Dark Steel, I believe. Um, but yeah, th this thing, I this, this is what I remember the most uh, about this year uh was was that uh yeah the modern masters release and just like just absolutely crushing people effortlessly because it's like oh i, I drew my valdokan shackles <laughs> this game is really hard uh yeah this is definitely up there with something like masticore um just unbelievably uh brutal card to play against man this, this <laughs> that was fun that was fun such a dirty feeling though oof good stuff all right, and this is a weird one. You're probably thinking like Arc Lightning is what you remember, not the reprint of the Onslaught Fetchlands or anything, or, or Siege Rhino or whatever. Nope, it was Arc Lightning. Uh, why? Because I love Dark Lightning. This was one of my favorite cards from when I first started playing in uh, Urza Saga. So maybe this is kind of like a cop out or whatever, but uh, I loved. I love Dark Lightning. It's one of my favorite cards. I'm always thinking of like, you know, the times when I kill three one ones with it. I'm like, oh, this is the greatest thing of all time. And like, then you can just like, if they don't have any one ones, you can just throw it at their face. Oh boy. I mean, it was good. You know, that was exciting to me back in the day. And it, it still is, right? Like, I just love burn spells that like, let you split it up, like violent eruption and stuff like that. Um, Feels good, feels good. So it's got some pretty good art, you know, some pretty good Seb McKinnon art. Again, not as good as the original art from Saga, um, but definitely a very sweet card and one of my favorite cards from the set. And speaking of favorite cards, in Magic Origins, they decided to uh, print my good friend Goblin Piledriver again. While this hasn't seen a ton of play or success in like more modern formats, uh, it's definitely a sweet card that I love. Um, it has that incredible Matt Kavoda art, which they kept. You know, it's just uh, just a great card when it was printed back in the day. It was so good against the Tog decks and, and other blue decks. And um, it just really was just the whole nine yards. Definitely the best uh, Squire they've printed for red. Um, Pro blue, you know, two mana fireball, sometimes one mana fireball. Uh, 
and definitely uh, is really good in the Goblin decks because it gives you a, an ability to, yeah, just to tutor up a fireball, basically. Um, so the damage output is is awesome. Uh, so yeah, the, I mean, the, the card is just great. Great art. Love the Makavoda art. Great abilities. Um, you know, got that two toughness so it can survive things like E-Play, which I think was the point. <laughs> um, you know, can't be blocked. Back then it was Tog, and then it was True Name, and now it's like Murktide. Um, or all sorts of other dumb blue creatures. Uh, Pile Driver just been pulling his weight. Definitely uh, one of the better goblins they've ever printed, but also a very balanced one. Not not like uh, you know something ridiculous like Lackey or, or Recruiter or whatever. So a very sweet card. And another card that's really sweet, probably one that I loved a lot, was Collective Brutality. Definitely a, a sweet card because. A, you know, I love discard. Discard's great. I love it. Um, but the escalate uh, where you can just, you know, discard um, your random cards that are dead or, or, or not good or whatever to get like all these additional effects is sweet. Um, you know, obviously all the effects are good and pretty general, you know, like the drain two is good. The kill a creature minus two minus two is good. The limited discard is good. Um, you can pitch cards in your own graveyard. Like, you know, you could discard Gristlebrand or whatever to kill their <laughs> Thalia or Melly Mage or something like that. Um, definitely just a sweet card. It does all sorts of uh, cool things. I'm a huge fan of Collective Brutality. It's a great sideboard card against decks like uh, Burn and Modern. Um, so, yeah, I mean, not, not much to say. Flexible, powerful, uh, but not broken. So what, what more could you ask for? this guy and the exert mechanic in general which i thought was just so cool and so good like i really was a huge fan of like the round enough red decks around this time um those decks were awesome exert was a big part of that the exert creatures uh, all just the different kind of maybe tricksy sort of creatures uh that red had uh, awesome just super awesome and glory bringer is the biggest splashiest one of them all uh, this card is sort of like uh, can FTK things. Obviously, you don't have the FTK your FTK moment because of the non-Dragon Claws. But uh, five mana four four flying haste is like whatever. Uh, but the exert is like lets you kill a thing and uh, you know uh, uh, deal a bunch of damage. Um, that's awesome. And there's of course is a lot of you know skill testing stuff like oh do I just swing for four and then next turn I exert or you know vice versa or whatever um you know when do you play this do you open it up to removal like I mean just all all of the uh, uh things to take into account is really awesome really fun with this card you know definitely uh, it just I love the almond cat dragons which are basically like giant flying crocodile things uh which is very cool um, I mean, I, there's not much more to say. This card is just very well designed, uh, a very powerful card. And of course, it's uh, it's nice that it's rare and not mythic. Um, so th this card is not, look, got it. It's got it. The whole nine yards. I love this card. I hope they bring back Exert at some point, whether in a new Amonkhet set or, I don't know, some Modern Horizons 3 or whatever. But uh, sweet card, sweet art. Um, great abilities, just awesome. Now, of course, we have Trash Master. And this guy is basically um, the first really good goblin they printed in since really like Mog War Marshal. Now, shortly before this, uh, I believe they did print uh, Dominaria, which of course had Chain Whirler, which was pretty good. Um, but Chain Whirler, well, obviously, is, um, uh, I guess that technically counts, although it was less important to the uh, like legacy uh, versions of, of goblins or even the modern versions or whatever but um, yeah b big fan of trash master because also in addition uh, this is the first goblin that really lets you hate on artifacts really well which is great because sometimes those were a problem against stoneforge decks trying to deal with gta or batter skull or or swords or whatever um, so this was great against those as well as just being in general a four mana three three lord um, which was, again, very good against things like Engineer Plague or uh, Plague Engineer, or, of course, you know, later on, like Blazing Salvo and and uh, and the festivities and stuff. So definitely a great uh, four-drop, sweet art, um, 
sweet flavor text, uh, just a really nice clean design and, and uh, a, good, a good return to form for them to, to print more good goblins. They, they remember that this tribe exists. And speaking of things existing or maybe not existing in the first place, uh, Time Wipe. This card is sweet because I love casting it in Commander. That's basically it. I just look at this thing, I'm like, I have this one super high value creature in play. Everyone has all these other creatures in play. I can just like time wipe, get the guy back, and then kill all the other things. And uh, yeah, and it's great. I love it. Time wipe, definitely one of my favorite cards. It's kind of like a pseudo bounce spell. It saves your guy. Um, I love it. It's just so cool. Like I'm a huge fan of time wipe. Uh, one of the more fun, but also, you know, fair cards to play in commander uh it's super sweet i just like doing a lot of the bouncy stuff and just getting value from your board wipes not having to kill like your really high value creatures um always feels really really great uh and the flavor tax is just like teferi being like you know uh you know like that uh, uh dave Chappelle meme you know the cold-blooded like yeah that's that's exactly what's happening here just great art uh everything's just Sweet, just definitely my uh, my favorite card from uh, War of the Spark and 2019 in general. Very important to me. So yeah, there you go. All right, and now we have, of course, Moxus. This card is sweet. This is uh, again one of my favorite Goblin cards. Uh, definitely an honorary Titan in his own right. Uh, although he can get a lot, lot bigger than 6-6 uh, six, six for sure. Um, this card is just insane. Uh, I wouldn't want to say it revolutionized how the decks play, but it gives them like this extremely overpowering endgame where you can just matron for it uh, to, to cast it on, you know, turn 6 or 7 or whatever and just like basically win immediately, especially if you hit like a, a war chief. Um, so that's really great. Uh, it just gives you so much value. Uh, obviously, this card is insane to lackey into on the second turn. Um, just like the the art is great, the effects are incredible. Um, even just the lore around him, where Moxus isn't one person. It's like these five brothers, and they roll a dice to see who gets to be the king for the day. Uh, but I think if they roll a six, like they take the day off or something, or maybe it's a one or something. I, I don't know. Anyway, it's just like great art, uh, silly story, um, just awesome, just super, super fun. I hope this guy gets uh, printed into uh, a modern at some point because this card is just so great. Like everyone, like everyone knows those cards like that they come into play and like they just groan it's like, oh, this thing again. But with Muxus, it's always really exciting because you don't know what's going to happen. Are they going to get six goblins? Are they going to like blank on it and it's still like a game kind of right because like you know if they only have a couple guys in play like have two guys in play and then they play a muxus or whatever like a matron and a uh a pile driver it's like okay like maybe i can kind of come back from this so it's like more exciting um but you know sometimes you just get completely splattered like they reveal like a you know patchlick uh two experts and a sling gang and it's like they annihilate your board and deal you a million damage and then you just like super die uh, but it's, it's such a fun card. Everyone loves it. Um, it's super exciting and, uh, absolutely the best card from this year. Uh, it just, it's, it's perfect. Most perfect goblin card of all time. Well, maybe anyways, this card, I love Kavu and this is the first Kavu they printed in forever. Uh, the first domain card they printed in forever. Um, and it's like, I'm looking at this thing, I'm like, oh man, with like Triomes and Shocklands, I'm going to be able to get a two mana 5-5 five, five on turn two. And so that's really exciting. Um, and this card has not exactly uh, done as well as I, I thought it would, like in Modern. Uh, but it's still very good. It still does a lot of cool stuff. I mean, it, it rummages uh, so you can get rid of, you know, extra lands or dead cards. Um, it's Graveyard Hate. Uh, it, I mean, this card is so cool. Uh, I just love it. I mean, again, I just love Kavu. Uh, this thing is so sweet. It's I don't even know what the heck's going on. It's just destroying stuff. It's, you know, it's the Kavu's territory. You got to get out of the way, bro. Um, yeah, not, not much else to say here. This thing is just super, 
super sweet, um, really great for like the zoo decks or the you know domain zoo decks, uh, along with of course Scion of Draco, which is again another one that I really really like. Um, Scion of course pumps this guy, makes him have trample and first strike. What? Two mana five five trample first strike? Like oh oh I love it. Yes, so great. What a sweet card. Last but of course certainly not least, Invoke Despair. This card is great because it shows off how um, black actually can kill enchantments these days, which is great. And it's a five mana card and it makes your opponent sack a bunch of stuff. Um, but if they can't, they lose life and you draw a card. So like you're never really um, out, you know, it's never like a dead card or whatever. And it hits uh, creatures, planeswalkers and enchantments, which is awesome. So you can get rid of things like um, Abundant Growth or Wild Growth or whatever, their Planeswalker, um, you know, and a creature. I mean, that's pretty sweet. So this card is very cool in the uh, Coffers decks in uh, Modern, of course, Cabal Coffers being another recently printed card in 2001, right, in uh, Modern Horizons 2. Uh, but yeah, Invoke Despair, I mean, uh, just a great card, a balanced card, um, you know, shows shows what Black is doing these days killing creatures and planeswalkers and enchantments. Uh, so that definitely feels like a 2022 card, you know. Um, you wouldn't mistake this for a card from 1999 or something like that, a reprint or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, Invoke Despair, um, great balance card, big fan. There you go. So that's it. That's it, guys. Um, that's just all the cards I really liked. Uh, obviously, it's not quite 30 years because, you know, 2023 is, you know, when it's the actual 30th anniversary, but that's okay. That's okay. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you uh, really liked it. Hope you, you know, feeling pretty good, pretty groovy, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but that's it for today, guys. So thanks for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed this and got to listen to me talk to all this stuff and all that kind of thing. So thanks for stopping by and have a great day.